Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Emily Beauregard. I'm the director of Kentucky Voices for Health and a member of the Thrive Kentucky campaign. It's good to see everybody in 2023 for the first time. Um, you know, we had two kind of quiet weeks over the holidays and 2023 is off to a busy start and has just kind of taken us by force. So um, we have the legislation, the legislative session under the way, underway and uh, a lot of updates to share with you today. Um, I know some people are still coming in from the waiting room. Um, we're having this particular um, state and federal policy update on a Monday, and uh, we'll have a few others on Mondays during um, the legislative session so that we're not conflicting with any of the committee meetings or other business happening um, with the General Assembly. So that may be um, a little bit of a surprise to folks. And I know Mondays can be pretty busy. So we might have a smaller crowd today, but we will have a recording available for everyone. We'll have the slides available to you and, and share those out in an email tomorrow um, for people that need to, to have those to catch up on things. Um, and I know that most of you are familiar with our Thrive Kentucky campaign by now. I was just thinking um, recently about how long we've been having these uh, monthly updates. And we started back in 2020, just a couple of months after the pandemic began, we realized that we needed to provide updates on things that were just shifting and changing frequently from one month to the next um, as we were trying to get out a lot of uh, information about the pandemic and relief programs and resources. And we've realized that we need to continue these because you know, even though we're three years in, um, there's still a lot that happens and changes from one month to the next. And so we have been as a campaign um, trying to bring those good updates to y'all, uh, make sure people have the opportunity to, to know what's changing with our safety net programs and other um, public assistance. And uh, we will also be um, telling you a little bit more about some other thick plans that we have for the year um, at the end of this webinar. Um, so Thrive Kentucky, we advocate for a strong and equitable safety net, and uh, we want to make sure that everyone in Kentucky has their basic needs met. And so we use these shared principles that you can see on this slide in order to guide our work because we recognize that many of our fellow Kentuckians face uh, historical and systemic barriers to meeting their basic needs. And uh, we want to focus our policy solutions that systemic change that we need to make sure every Kentuckian can thrive on policies that are anti-poverty and anti-racist so that we have a more equitable and just commonwealth for everyone. You can see um, our members of our campaign here. And if you wanna learn more about any of our organizations, you can click on those links when you get the slide deck. And uh, we always want to thank our sponsors. Um, we have two at the moment, we're adding more. Um, we had quite a few sponsors for our 2022 series, and we're just kind of getting that updated now. Um, there's still plenty of time if your organization wants to sponsor this work. Um, just feel free to reach out to me or Kelly, uh, but we really do appreciate the support. It helps us to put these webinars on for free and to make sure that people have access to this information. Um, we also provide uh, CEUs for certified community health workers and for licensed social workers at no cost. And that's also something that um, sponsorship helps to, to support as well. So here's the agenda that we're going to be covering today. Um, we really want these webinars to be an opportunity for you to get those updates um, on state and federal policies and what the landscape looks like currently, what we know is changing, what to prepare for. Um, we'll give you updates on safety net programs, and we always want to hear your feedback and hear your questions so that um, we know what's important um, for you and how we can best support your work on the ground. Um, during each section as we go, um, be sure to put any questions or comments that you have in the chat. We'll try to cover those as we go. We are usually able to get to everyone's questions. Um, if we can't, then we'll follow up with you with written answers. So don't let that stop you from um, asking a question or sharing some experience that you've had um, in the work that you do that would be relevant to this today. Um, and we will be, as I said, sending out the recording, the slide deck and other information as a follow-up tomorrow so you can watch for that. Um, we do have a lot of folks on the line today, so be sure to keep your microphone on mute um, and use that chat box 
um, if you have any questions or comments that you want to make. And again, if, if you need CEUs, if you're interested in that, um, just reach out to Kelly and she can help take care of that. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kelly and to Kara to give us a legislative session update. So I will be as quick and uh, fast as possible. It's um, before we can really get into understanding the 2023 regular session, it's good to have a quick synopsis of what happened in the 2022 election. Um, so for anyone who's missed us the last month or so, just for context, the current House of Representatives makeup is 80% Republican, 20% Democrat. And in the Senate, uh, 31 of 38, which I'll let the economists in the room do the quick percentage math on that, are Republicans and six are Democrats. Since they have all been sworn in last week, uh, there is a new vacancy. Morgan McGarvey from Louisville, who won the uh, congressional third district that Congressman Yarmouth vacated last year. Um, he is now sworn member of Congress. So that is now a vacancy where the special election will be held on February the 21st. So we'll have a new state senator this session. Also last week, but not included in the slide here, uh, Senator Ralph Alvarado from Winchester um, has been chosen by Tennessee Governor Bill Lee to be the Commissioner of Health in Tennessee. So he submitted his letter of resignation formally last week. And um, because it's active session, the Senate president has the authority to um, determine that special election date. And it is set for May the 16th, which is the same day as the state's primary election this year. Um, so that's just a little context on the Republican versus Democratic split in each chamber. The voter turnout in 2022 was abysmal. Um, it was the worst one we've seen in a primary turnout in Kentucky since 1994. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is just a reminder that this is an odd year session. So 30 days. And I say 30 days loosely and lightly because we all know that uh, number is actually much larger. But there's 30 official business days that the legislature will uh, convene and conduct business on. They must adjourn sine die for the year by March the 30th. That is in Kentucky's Constitution. But the, the period that begins today uh, and runs through February the 6th, the day before they return from their legislative recess on February the 7th, is a great time to try to meet with your legislators, meet the new ones, uh, get in front of new chairs, current members, and talk about the issues important to you because they are having meetings. Um, although it's not an official convening day, they are conducting business. Uh, we've received multiple standing committee agendas already to be held for this week, so we know they're there. Um, all of this information and more, and we'll go over a little bit more in a, another slide, legislature.ky.gov. It has everything from links to your live streams, how to access your legislators one by one, how to figure out who your legislator is, um, and more. Next slide. So the main um, important part of this, because we already talked about some of it, is that there's a number of new committee chairs. Some of them have been members for a while. Some of them are members that were just elected in November, which is a little unusual actually. Um, typically to become a chair or leadership position, you have served at least one term. Um, but there are quite a few newly elected members who are vice chairs and co-chairs of quite a few committees. The posting rules um, and operational rules of both the House and the Senate they always change something. Um, I've never known a legislature that um, doesn't change at least something. Uh, it's just that sometimes it's more substantive than others. This year's rule changes are House Resolution 2 and Senate Resolution 2. They were adopted last week um, and they were relatively minor and technical in nature. They more uh, reinforce the major changes that were made last year and the year before that, um, that expedite unfortunately in ways how quickly legislation can move um, and the access to that legislation by the general public. I'll give you an example of how one of those happened last week. Um, typically when a bill from the cross chamber, so when a house bill is received in the Senate or when a Senate bill is received in the House, 
um, is announced by the Senator House clerk respectively, it used to be dedicated to the House Rules uh, or the Senate Rules Committee for the Committee on Committees to look at it and assign it. And there's a much longer process before it can actually move. Um, last week when the Senate bill was received in the House, it was immediately assigned to the Committee of Jurisdiction. And so that means it can be posted at any point in time by that committee chair. Um, so operationally, not a whole, whole lot of difference, big picture, but on the inside baseball, for those of us who do advocate for issues that are important to us in Frankfurt, it changes a lot. Um, it means that things can immediately get assigned. If they call a committee meeting that afternoon, you're talking a matter of minutes sometimes when things really start to move quickly towards the end of session. We will be updating the accessibility guide um, that is something that we've been doing for several years now. Emily and uh, Dr. Schuster really spearhead that. And it's just a useful tool on everyone um, who is not as familiar with Frankfurt as some of us on where to go, how to call, who to call, what to ask for, what to say, how to email. Um, there's new numbers and there's a slide at the end here. Um, there's a new feature this year where we have a Spanish speaking uh, legislative message line. There's all sorts of ways you can access the General Assembly, um, and it is all available to the public knowledge, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's easy to find on your own. So we will be updating that guide and getting it out to everyone. Uh, next slide. So the big committee changes for this year. Uh, previously, we've had the Senate Health and Welfare Committee and the House Health and Family Services Committee. And during the interim, of course, it's a single um, interim joint committee. Both of these committees have been split into two, and there's now a health services and families and children committee, respectively, for both the House and the Senate. Um, these are more than just, quote, health care. These are all public assistance programs, KTAP, TANF, SNAP, Medicaid, um, the delivery of health care, addressing health disparities, these are some all-encompassing big committees that um, the majority of us in the webinar today, I think, pay attention to a little more closely than others. So it's just important to note um, that these have bifurcated. Uh, we have Representative Kim Moser and uh, Rep. Heverin, who will be the House Chairs for Health Services and Families and Children, respectively. And Steve Meredith um, is assuming the chair position of Health Services now that Senator Alvarado has departed. Um, and Senator Danny Carroll will be the Senate Families and Children's Chair. Um, the links here, when you get the slide deck tomorrow, are active and take you to the landing pages so that you can understand a little better their jurisdiction, what they intend to do, uh, the priorities they are setting for themselves. And uh, last week, the Senate Families and Children's Committee met for the first time. They'll be holding their second meeting this week on the 12th. Um, if you missed it, it might be helpful just to go back and watch it because they do outline their general priorities and what they intend to seek out and achieve uh, this session and in general moving forward. Um, and again, those are all available on the live streams and we'll send those links to you all tomorrow. And I think the next slide. So this is just a reminder uh, before I hand it to Kara to talk about some of the legislative priorities this year. 2023, I know 2022 was a primary election cycle, nationally important. 2023 is a significant election year for Kentuckians. Uh, we do kind of vote for our statewide offices in an off year, but this is your governor, your uh, secretary of state, attorney general, auditor, treasurer, commissioner of agriculture. The statewide constitutional offices are all on the ballot. Um, the primary is May 16th, and all your registration deadlines are there on this slide. It's never too soon to be sure you're registered to vote. Um, and of course, making sure that everyone around you is also registered to vote because it sneaks up on you. And when you have an abysmal turnout, like 41.8%, like we did in 2022, um, you'll probably be hearing us harp on this a little more than usual this year in anticipation of that. Next slide. And this is where I'll hand it to Ms. Kara to talk about legislative priorities for the 2023 session. 
Hi, y'all. Um, I probably misnamed this because we're not really talking about sort of any you know, Thrive Kentucky's legislative priorities. We're mostly today discussing what bills currently exist and, and bills that are, are a big time notability or otherwise important um, to this coalition more than sort of um, our legislative priorities. And of course, also want to make space for the fact that Tyler blew the whole meeting up by um, revealing that the annex library has been moved and reduced in size, which if you've ever come to um, Frankfurt, that is a clutch place for advocates to convene and gather. It is like an unofficial office space, especially for um, nonprofit advocates. So the session is underway, but nobody's in Frankfurt right now, because if you saw in Kelly's slide, we're already in that go home stage of the legislature so that the legislators are actually back in their home districts and a great time to talk, about, talk to them about that. Um, we What we anticipate that will be the big topics of this session will be the budget that's already been filed, it's already passed the House. We're gonna talk about that more um, and it's bad. Um, and then also we expect that there will be some especially housing focused funding um, sent for the East Kentucky floods. Um, and of course, there's a very high priority for the Bowling City Military Center, uh, the veterans benefit. We did have two really active task forces that happened over this past interim, one of which has vowed to continue, but both of which put out significant recommendations um, and both have ideas about addressing the benefits cliff meaning that when somebody is eligible for work support, um, like Medicaid or child care assistance or SNAP or KTAP, um, what happens when the income changes significantly, and especially about child care, which is by far the harshest sort of of those cliffs, that's where we've gotten some ideas. Nothing has been filed yet. We don't know who's going to file it, unless if one of you do, please come to the chat and share. If anybody's met with a legislator and heard about um, a child care benefits cliff bill is being filed, we have been told that um, you know, they do expect the follow through and the recommendations from those task force. Um, there are several bills related to regulating cannabis, both criminalizing and, and medical cannabis. Um, there's bipartisan support, but like in years past, there has been a pretty firm wall in the Senate. Um, it's one of those situations, if you Google it, there's a lot of public support, especially for medical cannabis regulation. Um, and it has been a dead, dead, dead in the Senate. So go to the next slide. I just got a couple of specific bill numbers on here. House Bill 1 is that budget bill. House Bill 1 is the follow-up to House Bill 8 from last session. Um, KY Policy is the lead on this for at, at least me and I think most everyone um, in the Thrive Coalition because they look at this thing, these things most closely. I mean, they've got quite a few good letters. There was a sign on by most, if not all members of Thrive um, letter about the House Bill 1, which lowers the rate from 4.5 to 4 beginning January 1st next year. Um, the issue with that is that is based on um, inflation that is not going to be there soon, and we actually don't have these increases and includes a lot of federal government, so it is kind of a, a, a trick. So it's like, oh, look, yes, the economy has gone up, and so therefore we can afford to. The trigger has been hit. Um, the trigger was bad to start with, but even if the trigger has been hit, it is temporary at best. Um, because it's a result of pandemic funding, federal funding, um, and inflation, which is not permanent. And of course, I hope everybody has seen and heard that the way House Bill works, and then again, House Bill 8, and then House Bill 1 now, would mean that the top 1% of earners in Kentucky who make an average salary of $1.4 million would be receiving, you know, an over $11,000 tax cut, and more than a family of four spends on food in Kentucky an entire year. And those, and, you know, most working Kentuckians would get Plenty to under $300 um, a year out of that. So it's a great deal for really rich folks um, and not a great deal for about 99% of Kentuckians. Um, the next one that we've got in there is the sports betting. That, that's just really a hot topic. It's also a part of our funding system. The idea of it, it's, it's got a lot of bipartisan support. That bill, is, if it were to pass the House, that would likely not be the bill that actually passed. That's the bill that's filed thus far. If you'll notice, I've got several hedges on this slide so far, still to come, um, because there will be more bills filed about these issues, um, and there will likely be a Republican-sponsored bill filed around sports betting um, to address that issue. And, you know, we don't know what will happen, but it's passed the House before, 
So there's a decent chance to say that that will happen again. And then, of course, there is that regulation of cannabis, which um, all three of those bills have Democratic sponsors, which, again, means likely if that were to pass, it would require some um, different sponsors. There is bipartisan support for some of them. Um, but again, the Damon Thayer has said that he has no interest in it in the Senate publicly. And of course, that could always change. Damon Thayer is the um, the person who calls bills to the floor in the Senate. So um, if that's something you care about, he's the person to direct your attention towards as he is the floor leader of the Senate. We just have a list down here of other things that KVH, since that's um, where I work, what we're specifically just sort of looking at, because those are ones that have, again, already been filed. Um, and beyond that, we have hopes and expectations of other bills, and we'll be continuing to have meetings for that. Um, but that's nothing else is there right now. Again, even though it's a short session, I do anticipate there will be many more bills filed because we've never had a session where there haven't been. So that would be a you know first time ever situation, which is highly unlikely. Um, and with that, uh, we'll move on. So, well, I mean, and by move on, I mean, I hope all of you are already doing this. And if not, get out your phones right now. Open up your calendar app, put the alerts in your calendars, not joking because it's really easy to forget otherwise. Put your alerts in your calendars and save that message line. Um, you know, save it under whatever you want, like something I care about or most important, uh, or make sure to call every Monday. Whatever works for you, you can choose to save it, but just put it in there and make sure, and like Kelly mentioned, there is now a Spanish language line, so um, which will hopefully be more inclusive for a lot more Kentuckians. So spread that word. Um, make the phone calls, phone calls, you know, there's kind of a hierarchy, like in-person meetings matter the most, you know, phone calls below there, you know, and then other forms of contact, you know, like email, real emails that you actually write, um, and then sort of form emails. You're asking me, that's kind of the ranking. So um, leaving messages matters a lot. Moving on. Who set the slides? There we go. Um, so now that I have awkwardly opened that door, Dustin, I hope I didn't say anything incorrect about House Bill 1, but I'll turn it over to Dustin, who undoubtedly, I bet, will tell us more about House Bill 1. Definitely, and you were um, effectively stealing my thunder, so good job. Um, so, oh. no, no, it was good. I, that was no sarcasm. Um, so we uh, often kind of go through a broader economic update uh, during these calls as a lot of this is about um, our safety net and, and kind of how uh, great the need is for a lot of these supports. Um, we're gonna truncate that this week and then get like Kara talked about a little more into House Bill 1 uh, during this section. So just to start out, um, you know, I just wanna remind folks that we have fully recovered all the jobs that we lost during the pandemic. We are we're in the middle of one of the most rapid uh, and historic recoveries that we've ever had in the state. Um, a lot of that is due to the fact that we had over $45 billion in federal money pumped into the Commonwealth over the course of two years. And those supports through unemployment, through direct checks, through state uh, funding really helped make sure that we could recover a lot of the jobs that we lost um, pretty quickly. Um, we've regained 313,000 jobs since April 2020, um, and it took 30 months to do that, um, whereas during the Great Recession, it took us 77 months. So now we're, we're now nearly a full percentage point above where we were um, back in 2020. And that's despite the fact that quits are still pretty high. People are leaving jobs and, and then getting jobs that pay better or offer more flexibility or better benefits or a better fit to them. Um, that means that hires are, are even higher than quits right now and layoffs are still pretty low. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, speaking of which, um, folks may um, have noticed that uh, because layoffs are low, unemployment is also pretty low. Um, it's about half of uh, its pre-pandemic level still. It's been creeping up a little bit in recent months, which usually happens after the holidays. Um, a lot of retailers start to shed um, jobs that they, they hire temporarily um, to meet the holiday rush. And so we're kind of in the middle of that right now. Um, but I anticipate it will remain low until something changes, which is really great right now. Um, but let's move on to the next slide. It won't always be like that. Um, uh, last year in 2020, uh, a bill called House Bill 4 um, was filed and passed that cuts unemployment insurance. Uh, if you've 
if you've been around us, you've heard us talk about this a lot. Um, I think it's especially pertinent now because it went into effect on January 1, and it cuts uh, unemployment benefits in a couple ways. It does this specifically through reducing the duration that benefits are available to folks who have lost their job and fall to their own. So un unemployment insurance was established in Kentucky in 1938, and up until last week, uh, people had 26 weeks of benefits available to them. Uh, through that whole time, which was good. I mean, you, what you want is enough runway for folks to be able to find uh, a job that meets their skills, that's within their career path, uh, that pays close to what their last job did. Um, this bill, however, cuts it down to um, 12 weeks, as little as 12 weeks, and it changes depending on uh, an unemployment rate from anywhere between three to six months previous. Um, and uh, for us right now, it means we're in 12 weeks. This chart here on the red shows the number of weeks that would have been shorted to claimants had this bill been in place going all the way back to 1990. So you'll see that it's so strict that in only two six month periods, we would have had uh, you know, the maximum number of weeks available under House Bill 4, which is 24 weeks. It also increases the number of job search activities you have to conduct each week in order to keep your job. But then it also changes what's called the suitability standard, which just says this is the type of job you have to take in order to, um, or after, you know, what, a suitable job that you have to uh, accept while you're on unemployment benefits, um, at which point your benefits get cut off. It used to be that that, again, was pretty broad, that folks could uh, look around for a job within their career field that uh, matched their, their skills and uh, their previous pay. This says after just six weeks that you have to take the first job offered to you uh, so long as it's within 30 miles of your house um, uh, and as long as it pays a little over half of what your last job paid. So imagine a factory worker who's making $25 an hour. Um, they get laid off because their factory closes. After six weeks, if, if a job offers them $13.50, they've got to take it um, or else their benefits get cut off. And it, it really, they get cut off either way. Um, the one good thing that House Bill 4 did is it includes um, something called work sharing, which is a, a, an opportunity for employers to reduce the hours of their employees rather than lay them off and have unemployment benefits make up some of the income that's lost from those reduced hours. That means that workers get to keep their job, they get to keep their benefits, their retirement, um, and still have some of their lost wages replaced by unemployment insurance. And workers get to keep skilled workers who are already attached to their, their jobs and um, not have to go through the process of rehiring someone later on. So it, it is a good policy. It just, uh, I think most of us here on the call wish that they had done that um, separate from the rest of House Bill 4. Um, all right, so let's move on to the next slide. So um, Kara, sort of introduced this idea of uh, the General Assembly's desire to cut the income tax in Kentucky. Um, sometimes you'll hear this referred to as the March Toward Zero, which is a 0% income tax. Um, just to, a quick primer on the income tax, uh, it makes up over 41%. This bar chart's a little bit old. Um, as of last year, it made up 41% of our total general fund. So it's our single largest source of revenue in the state. It's about $6 billion in, in fiscal year 2022. Um, and in, the income tax is pretty good at uh, growing with the economy. So wages go up, and so the income tax goes up as well over time. Um, and not only that, but it also uh, ensures that our highest earning individuals are paying a reasonable amount of their income tax. So uh, let's go on to the next slide. What the General Assembly decided to do uh, is instead create a, create a situation wherein uh, the income tax gets reduced by half percentage point increments. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute and offset some of that by new sales taxes on things like dry cleaning and, and some other um, services. Uh, but the reality is that those services really only make up $1 for every $12 lost in uh, the income tax. So this uh, chart over here represents um, on the left what a half percent cut is in 2024 and in 2025 what a full percent cut is. So a full percent cut in the income tax is about $1.2 billion uh, per, per fiscal year. It's, it's a lot of money. 
Uh, so let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so in 2022, the, the General Assembly passed House Bill 8, like we mentioned, it sets up this uh, half percent, half percentage point decrease in the income tax. Um, in 35 years, uh, if this goes into effect, the cut would be roughly equivalent to every dollar that we spend on Medicaid. Um, and it would make up, and it would um, recoup very little of that cost in sales tax. So in order for the income tax to be cut, Dustin, can you hear us? Hopefully, we'll give it just a few seconds and see if he comes back. Otherwise, we can skip ahead and come back to him if we need to. Dustin, come back. None of the rest of us know this as well. It looks like he might have just dropped off. You know, power down, power up, universal solution. Oh, I keep thinking I'm going to see him in the waiting room. Why don't we move forward and then uh, when Justin gets back on, we'll hop back to let him finish up this section. So Adrian, um, if you're available, why don't we go ahead and do the housing update? That sounds great to me. All right, I'm Adrian Bush. I'm the director of the Homeless and Housing Coalition of Kentucky. And yes, I do have a foam brush in my left hand. Okay, next slide. All right. So um, just a brief kind of snapshot on where we were through 2022 around people experiencing homelessness in the Commonwealth. One way we track that is through the point in time count. As you can see, um, it had kind of, it been declining from about 2013 on. Then we have the 2020 um, count, which was done in January of that year. A 2021 sheltered only count as well as the 2022 count. Um, the other reason we like to include these numbers is to show that housing is not, or homelessness is not just a Louisville or Lexington problem. Over half the people counted in the 22 count um, were experiencing homelessness in the balance of state. Next slide. If you would like to participate in the K count or the point in time count to help us get more accurate numbers, um, you have an opportunity. And that is Wednesday, January 25th. Across the state, there will be various counts happening. Obviously, um, different communities may count. Um, everybody does it pretty much at the same day, on the same day, but maybe the times are a little bit different. Um, so there are, uh, there's some training going on this week. Um, and here in Franklin County, we love a good K count. Just contact Cassie Carter on our staff to participate. And in Lexington, they do have a sign up form. All of these links are live and you will get the slide deck. Next slide. Okay. We do maintain a contact sheet of homeless service providers. We sort it by county as well as area development districts. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see our examples from um, Rowan County. Next slide. Okay, so I wanna talk briefly about rental assistance. It is still available. Um, we do wanna make sure that people know that um, with emergency rental assistance, the governor and the governor's office did reallocate some of the state's money to Lexington and to Louisville. So in Lexington, you can continue to apply COVID-19 renterhelp.org. That has not changed. In Louisville, the website stopmyeviction.org is now live again and is accepting applications through that portal. If you are in any of the other 118 counties in Kentucky, you will continue to apply through the Healthy at Home Eviction Relief Fund. Next slide. 
Okay, and housing assistance fund is still available. This is for folks with mortgages who may be behind on their mortgage payments, utilities, and other um, loan costs with, with um, associated with, with mortgage. Next slide. So it's at protectmykyhome.org. Kentucky received $85 million. There is still plenty of money left in this fund. Um, so anybody with a mortgage who is behind due to COVID has been impacted by COVID, we are strongly encouraging folks for, to get help through this fund. And the application is online. Next slide. Okay. Outside of the re rental assistance in the regular window for LIHEAP, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, um, just so you know, it, most community action agencies have opened the crisis assistance application window as of today. So in order to get in um, in that application window, because it generally is first come first serve, contact your local community action program to apply. Next slide. Okay, so as we talked about, we are in the middle of the legislative session. Um, and we are talking about the need for housing. So a lot of nonprofit housing developers, advocates came together in the fall after the wake of the Eastern Kentucky um, floods through it, and, and finding a need or finding a way to address that need as well as um, the larger housing need across the state. So this is called AHART. It is Affordable Housing Emergency Action Recovery Trust Fund. So you can see why we call it AHART. Instead, um, it is a legislative strategy to rebuild disaster impacted communities um, and respond to both current and future housing needs. And why is this necessary? We know from 2021 with the disasters, um, from the tornadoes and the floods um, from that year, that we have a remaining unmet housing need of $110 million. That's according to the Department for Local Government. Um, the proposed housing allocation from the Federal Community Development Block Grant um, Plan Fund is, is $40 million. That leaves at least a gap of $70 million to address outstanding housing needs that the feds are not going to be able to cover. Next slide. Okay, so that was 21, right? 2022 flooding has left us with even more damage. Um, and so these uh, graphics will show you kind of what the hardest hit um, counties were, were reporting in terms of home damage versus all of the 13 FEMA designated counties, um, as well as how do FEMA aid amounts compare to max possible amounts. And we know at in November, when I collected this from um, the Ohio River Valley Institute, the median awards for housing assistance were around $4,500, which is clearly not enough. Next slide. So in 2023, what we are asking for is the creation of AHART, $150 million for emergency home repair, new home build, multifamily capital repairs, technical assistance to include housing counseling, as well as administration so that we can actually get this fund up and going through Kentucky Housing Corporation. In 2024, we will be asking for another $150 million to sustain the rebuilding efforts. Um, to finish the repairs and rebuilds with long-term affordability, as well as housing counseling, especially with the con introduction of potentially predatory actors and expediting large redevelopment projects. Next slide. All right, we do have an existing affordable housing trust fund. Some people who live and breathe this stuff know this, if you do not, um, it is it is the state affordable housing trust fund, and it it, it generally receives about four to six million dollars annually through um, a deed transfer fee um, on every real estate transaction in the Commonwealth. So four to six million dollars is nice, but when it has to cover 
housing investments across 120 counties, that is not quite enough to meet the need, right? So we would be asking in 2024 for a $40 million appropriation just straight to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund for all of those activities. And then an additional 75 million appropriation specifically for vacant and abandoned property mitigation. We know this is an issue in our cities um, as well as our rural communities that we could do a lot to address the housing need if we had the ability to um, take control of of properties that have been abandoned, essentially. And then lastly, we would like to double the real estate deed transfer fee from $6 per transaction to 12. Next slide. Okay, so if you are interested in this concept of AHART and you have the ability to sign on behalf of an organization, feel free to join us. And we have a sample, or we have a toolkit for AHART partners. Um, with communications and tracking legislative meetings and all kinds of fun stuff. So if you're interested in joining that, let me know. Next slide. I will transfer it over or back uh, to let's Dustin. Go back to Dustin. And I think I'm just gonna have to flip through these. Sorry, everybody. That's like um it's like a horror scenario, like just your internet crashing while you're in the middle of talking about a budget reserve trust fund. Um, okay, I'm gonna try and go fast because uh, I'm sure there was like a delay there, my apologies. So recapping, House Bill 8 last year set this up. Um, the conditions, the two conditions I've got listed here were met for the first half percent decrease going from 5% to 4.5%. That kicked in already. So that's that's true as of January 1st of this year. So the question for this General Assembly was, do we need to take action for the second half percent decrease going from four and a half percent down to four percent, which the conditions were also meant for, but required some act on the part of the General Assembly. So let's go to the next slide. So that was step two, uh, which is House Bill 1 this year. Um, so House Bill 1 uh, brings it back down, brings it down an additional half percentage point, which is around half a billion dollars annually. Um, and this is past the uh, House, so it's moving on to the Senate. Um, we're really concerned because as uh, Tara mentioned earlier, the conditions that need to be met, so for example, having a large budget reserve trust fund and having large surpluses are largely, largely due to the fact that uh, sales taxes were up because a lot of people had more money to spend recently, and that money has sort of been echoing throughout the economy due to federal investments in the state. And two, uh, when inflation rises and so prices rise, that means the sales tax rises as well, which means that we, we do get more revenues through sales tax, but it also means that government costs go up as well. So uh, our surpluses are, are sort of an anomaly, if you will. Um, and so making permanent cuts to our income tax based off of temporary surpluses or surpluses that aren't actually surpluses or just larger because things cost more, um, really create a, a permanent dent in what we have to be able to afford things like Medicaid or afford things like education and so forth. So um, uh, this chart here on the left just kind of illustrates how much $1.2 billion is compared to other expenses that we have in state government, like Medicaid, we spent $2.4 billion on. Uh, K through 12, we spend about $2 billion in base seek funding. Um, we spend uh, about $1.1 billion every year on every public um, post-secondary education institution, so all of our universities and then our um, community college system. So $1.2 billion is a lot of money. And we also know that there are still a lot of outstanding um, expenses in state government. So uh, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, the other thing that uh, Tara already mentioned, but I just want to reiterate is that really the folks that this help are the folks who are our highest earners in the state. So the average uh, earner in Kentucky in the top 1% um, has a take home of about $1.4 million. And they're the ones who are gonna see the biggest 
um, benefit from House Bill 1, which uh, is a the full percentage point um, is valued at about $11,000. Um, so folks who are uh, the lowest income folks, they're not really going to see any benefit from this at all because um, if you are below the poverty line, you don't pay income tax in Kentucky. So um, the poorest million Kentuckys basically get no benefit from this at all, except for a few more sales taxes than what they've been paying in the past. So let's go on to the next slide. Just to wrap up, um, I, you know, this is a very similar uh, policy as what was tried in Kansas about 10 years ago. Folks may remember uh, then Senate, um, excuse me, Governor Sam Brownback uh, passed a very quick reduction in their income tax. Um, they brought it to zero almost immediately, and um, the results were disastrous. They they had very large class sizes. They had to furlough teachers and state workers. They ended up going to a four-day uh, school week in some districts because they couldn't afford five full days of school, um, and it was terrible. I mean, he ended up becoming, I think, uh, the I think it was like the ambassador of religious freedom. So he like ran out of Kansas because he was getting chased out. So uh, Kentucky is not doing this as quickly as Kansas did. So whereas Kansas's was a quick train wreck, Kentucky's is going to be a slow one, but the result will ultimately be the same. So uh, I, I, we're really concerned about this. I put a link in the chat earlier. Hopefully it actually made it into the chat um, for an action network um, letter that you can send. Although, as Kara said, face-to-face -face meetings or phone calls are better um, to urge now your senators um, not to go through with this huge permanent cut to our, our general fund. Um, so I urge you all to do that. Okay, now I can hand it over to Tyler for uh, food and PEBT. Thanks, Dustin. Um, hey, y'all, my name is Tyler Offerman. I work on food and hunger policy with the Kentucky Equal Justice Center. And uh, I don't know why I had two intro slides in there, but I did. Uh, just to connect real quick to what Dustin was saying, you know, all of the programs I'm about to talk about, uh, a lot of them get federal funding, but all of them are administered by the state. And if our tax code is such that we decimate investment in public goods, not just public programs, but actual public workers, then there won't even be staff to run these programs. So uh, I know taxes and budgets, sometimes it can glaze over the eyes, but it, it really is fundamental and important to all these programs. So don't sleep on that one. I'm gonna talk about some of these programs. I'm gonna try and be quick. Uh, we're gonna touch briefly on all of these, but there's a lot of resources in the back on more of them. Also happy to field any questions. In the chat, brief rundown on some of the major feeding programs and some of the eligibility. I won't talk through each of those, but they're here for you to look at. Go next slide. So real quick, um, wanted to lift up all of these programs are available to folks in Kentucky. The four in green, WIC, National School Lunch, PBT, and Summer EBT are available to all residents of Kentucky, um, regardless of citizenship. SNAP, the largest feeding program available to all US citizens and some legal residents depending on citizenship status. So there's some confusion has been over the past couple of years on how this will affect folks eligibility trying to become citizens. None of these programs will affect your eligibility and some of them are available to you regardless of your citizenship status. So next slide. So real quick, we have a big problem in Kentucky with hunger. We have a big problem in Kentucky with poverty, and it translates to how much food folks can afford to buy. Recently, uh, and Dustin touched on some of this, but inflation, food prices are skyrocketing. Food is more expensive. A uh, dollar does not stretch as far. So these are 2020 numbers. It's estimated there's 20 to 40% more uh, food insecurity than these numbers convey due to the fallout from the pandemic. So a lot of folks and a lot of kids in Kentucky currently don't know where their next meal is gonna come from. And that's something that we as advocates can help to address. Next slide. 
So as I mentioned, SNAP is the largest program. So sort of keeping a track on it can get a pretty good pulse. It's not perfect. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of folks who are hungry in Kentucky, and many of them are not on SNAP. Um, because I did mention some eligibility issues earlier. Also, it sometimes it's just hard. It's a bureaucratic system. Uh, again, that's some more advocates can help. But all that being said, July 2013, the height of the Great Recession, you can see that number, uh, almost 900,000 Kentuckians on SNAP. During the recovery, that number was almost cut in half. February 2020, 480,000 pandemic hits, that number shoots up, and you can see it's uh, zigged and zagged, and now it's starting to kind of level out at about 550,000, but increasing slightly uh, month over month. So not as bad during the as, as it was during the Great Recession, um, but it's clear that, you know, we're 80 to 100,000 people above the lowest point we were right before the pandemic. So a lot of people even though the top line numbers of job recovery, we've recovered all the jobs, there's still a lot of a lot more people in worse off shape than there was pre-pandemic. So next slide. Here's a little bit, just to look across the state at participation in SNAP, lowest at 2% in Oldham County, highest Owsley at 41.2. And I pulled out McCracken just to try and give you a, a little snapshot on what that actually translates to. So in that county, about 7,500 individuals, 3,500 families, and $1.3 million spent in SNAP benefits in McCracken County in November. So that plays out across the state in different ways. Um, but bottom line is last year, $1.2 billion went into the pockets of local farmers and grocers because of SNAP, and that's all federal money. So, you know, not only is SNAP important to keep people fed, but it's also a pretty important economic driver across Kentucky. And then just a little bit, benefit range 23, but the lowest is 23, highest is 283. The average per person is about 158. So that number used to be a lot higher when we had the things called emergency allotments earlier on in the pandemic, but since those are gone, um, that's the range we have now. So next slide. And on that note, when we had emergency allotments, um, it wasn't as important to do this, but now that they're gone, it is important. Make sure to update your case or work with the folks you work with to get as many deductions in uh, as they're allowed to make sure they can maximize their SNAP benefits. Not gonna read through all these, but again, here for you to look through. Next slide. All right, so summer EBT. This is something that we've talked about uh, on and off during the pandemic. It was something that did not exist before um, the pandemic in that it was created temporarily. The bill that passed Congress in the wee hours of 2022 called the Omnibus actually uh, made this program permanent. So moving forward in perpetuity, barring an act of Congress, uh, there will be a summer EBT program to replace meals that kids would get at school, but obviously aren't because school's not in session uh, because of the summer. So the state still has to do a bunch of um, planning around this to stand it up permanently, but at least gleaning what I could from the omnibus, it'll be about $120 per child per summer. After 2024, that, that number will be adjusted uh, a little bit, but Pretty big deal. Um, advocates have been fighting for decades to get a summer EBT program stood up. So the fact that it's permanent, pretty big deal. As my friend Ron Burgundy would say. So next slide. Another program, pandemic EBT. So this is not for the summer. This is for the school year. This is pandemic specific. Replace meals for kids that aren't at school because of either school closures or them getting sick. There is going to be a PVT plan for this year. However, I don't have any details. The state is working to submit its plan. There's a lot of uncertainty with is the public health emergency going to end or is it not? How that affects this. But suffice it to say, there will be some pandemic EBT and Thrive will certainly update y'all as soon as we know the details. 
Next slide. And then last thing, another thing that was in the omnibus, if you don't know about this, that's good in some ways, um, but there is a pretty big wave of uh, folks on EBT being ripped off, defrauded, and having their benefits stolen by uh, effectively a, a ring of thieves. So if, if you look at the pictures here, you can see a fake EBT reading device that is covertly put on top of a regular card reader that thieves will plant inside of stores and these devices actually steal your EBT information and they then take your benefits. We know it's happening in Kentucky. We know um, uh, tens of thousands, 20 to $30,000 in benefits have been stolen. Uh, it's not as bad in some states. California, New York, Massachusetts are seeing tens of millions of dollars stolen. Um, that being said, the omnibus created a temporary fix so that benefits can be reimbursed. It's not as robust as I know we were hoping, but it is something, and it directs the USDA to begin to solve this problem. Up until this point, neither states nor USDA have wanted to do anything, and it just lets families holding the bag with benefits that are stolen. So big problem, could get really bad, I'm glad to see a fix and we'll continue to work with the state to make sure we get as robust protections for folks on these programs as we can. So, uh, and if you have had your benefits skimmed, reach out to KJC and we would love to talk with you and support you. Next slide. And I think that's it. Thanks, Tyler. Hi, everyone. I'm Priscilla Easterling, the Outreach Coordinator for Kentucky Voices for Health. And so today I'm going to give you all some health updates, and there are quite a few. Um, so starting off, we have been continuously giving you all the updates of when the public health state, emer uh, state of emergency has been extended. Um, and now states were promised 60 day notice if it wasn't going to be extended. They didn't get that. So we do expect that to be extended again through April. Um, but now it means something different. Um, previously, when we talked about it, we talked about it in connection to Medicaid renewals. Uh, as we know, um, folks who have been enrolled in Medicaid for the last two, uh, since the pandemic began, since March 2020, um, anyone who's enrolled in Medicaid has not been able to be disenrolled um, or kicked off of Medicaid unless they have moved out of state, died, or asked to, uh, asked to have their coverage ended. But now that's going to change uh, because of the omnibus bill that Tyler was just talking about um, that delinked the maintenance of effort provision, which allowed people to stay enrolled in Medicaid um, from the public health emergency, which means that they also set a um, they actually set a date for Medicaid renewals to begin again, which is April 1st. So what we know. Um, there's still a lot that is up in the air, um, and we'll have more information next month. Next month is our quarterly uh, our quarterly uh, cabinet webinar. Wow, I can't think of that word, the thing that we're literally on. Um, our quarterly <laughs> webinar with the cabinet next month. And so there will be time to ask all of the questions and get more detailed information from the Department of Medicaid Services about how all of this is going to work, the real detailed timeline and all of that. But what we know right now is that next month they're going to start, the, they're going to initiate the first batch of renewals. Um, <clears throat> and so all that means they're going to start running the the people who are enrolled, they're going to start running the data sources and see what information they have, what information they need, and all of that. Um, we're, again, still not sure about the timeline of the notices and all of the things that are going to go out, but we do know that the first people who are deemed ineligible now for Medicaid, their uh, coverage will end April 30th, so May 1st will be the first day that they're no longer eligible for Medicaid. Um, Again, we don't have a clear idea of how all of that's gonna work yet, but next month we'll know more and we will definitely share more information as we get that. So in the meantime, what you can do, make sure that you update that contact information and connect. If you don't know how to do that, reach out to a connector. They can help you with that. Um, MCOs are also sending out notices to, to members to let them know what's going on. 
And as we get more information, we'll be sure to share it with you. Um, but it's so, so important that you make sure that your contact information is important because it's coming, we have a date, and now this is like very real. We've been talking about it for a year, but now April 1st is when we're, we're really, the rubber meets the road kind of thing. So if you have any questions, definitely reach out to connectors. They can help walk through this whole process with you as well. And we'll have more information next month. So next slide. <clears throat> So um, DMS, Department of Medicaid Services, has also released some, um, what we're calling, it's called the Unwinding the Maintenance of Maintenance of Effort Provision. Um, and so they've released some information about who they expect to be, um, who needs to take action, who they expect to need to do active work to renew their Medicaid. Um, we're looking at around 238,000 Kentuckians. This information is uh, at the. This is updated at the end of November. We'll have more updated information, hopefully for December, and then by next month we'll have up to date current information. Uh, so right now, 238,000. It's been fluctuating around that for about the last year or so. They've said around 250,000. So we expect that to stay around the same. Um, and the next two slides are actually just a breakdown of you know, who, who that impacts, what categories that impacts. Um, and there's also a racial and ethnic um, ethnicity breakdown as well. Um, we have a two-pager document that also breaks it down by geography and zip code um, by county. So we will also make sure to share that as well. Um, you don't need to like remember any of this information, but I think it's just really important to know who is going to be who's at risk and who uh, who's vulnerable in the situation, so that we can make sure that we're being really intentional about reaching out to people and making sure that they have the information that they need to make sure that they continue with their Medicaid and respond to any uh, request for information. So let's move on. <clears throat> so. Trucking right along to open enrollment. We are right at the end of open enrollment. It ends on Sunday. I cannot believe it went by so quickly, actually. Uh, for Medicaid, open enroll, um, for Medicaid, uh, you can always, uh, always, always, always year round apply for Medicaid throughout the year. But for the marketplace, open enrollment does run November 1st through January 15th. Um, but once open enrollment does close, there are special enrollment periods that are uh, available based on life circumstances, life changes, except, exceptional circumstances um, that are available on Connect as well. Um, but this is the last week of open enrollment. Anyone can go to connect.ky.gov. You input your information. It's very simple. Um, and uh, shop and enroll for a plan. If you haven't connected with a connector yet, uh, you can find a connector at that link right there or on connect.ky.gov as well. And connectors can really just walk through the entire process through with you, help answer any questions you have about health insurance or how any of it works, um, and really just help, help make sure that you're covered and your family's covered as well. Um, let's go to the next slide. So as of last week, 61,000 um, 61, Kentuckians had enrolled in a marketplace plan and around 52,000 of those had been effectuated, meaning that those people had paid their first month premium, which is pretty, pretty good um, during open enrollment. So since November 1st, there were also 22, 21,600 Medicaid applications. Um, so it's been a really busy time on Connect as well. Um, and I just loved, I love these numbers because I, I, it always uh, reminds me that people are getting enrolled, getting covered, and really making sure we will absolutely share the links. Um, those will go on the follow-up email tomorrow, I believe. <clears throat> but it always reminds me that people are just making sure that they're being proactive and taking care of their families and themselves and getting covered, which is just so important. Um, so busy time on Connect, and thankfully it's gone a little bit smoother this year than it did last year. So always there, optimistic news there. Next slide, please. Okay, so once open enrollment ends on the 15th, this Sunday, after that, in order to get enrolled in a marketplace plan specifically, again, Medicaid is open year round, but in order to get to be eligible to get enrolled on the marketplace, uh, you have to qualify for a special enrollment period. Now, special enrollment periods are specifically tied to qualifying life events. 
So those are some of the basic things like getting married, uh, having babies, uh, aging off of your insurance if you, when you turn 26, um, getting divorced or losing coverage, things like that. But two of the ones that I really, really want to highlight right now, um, as I was just talking about, those people who are going to be losing their Medicaid, potentially losing their Medicaid, that is a special enrollment period. That loss of Medicaid or KCHIP cover coverage is a special enrollment period and opens up a window to be able to get enrolled in marketplace coverage. You have 60 days before, um, so if you know, if you get a notice that uh, you, they don't think you're going to be eligible for Medicaid anymore and you feel like that's pretty accurate, um, you can go ahead at that point and go ahead and enroll on the marketplace and try and get through through a special enrollment period. I recommend working with a connector to do that because it can be a little complicated, um, but it's available to you. And if you have any problems, connectors can also walk you through that as well. But you can also call the call center if you prefer to do that, or there's more information at connect.ky.gov. Um, the other one that I want to point out is losing your employer-sponsored uh, insurance. <clears throat> One of the things that we've talked about previously is the family glitch, and there's a slide later in the deck that talks about it. Um, but for the family glitch, it is now fixed. It was a policy that previously prevented families from being eligible for um, advanced premium tax credits or the subsidy that really makes health insurance, the health insurance premiums affordable for folks. Um, but that family glitch was fixed, and that is now available on Connect as of December 16th. And so uh, for a lot of folks, because of when it became available on Connect, they were already enrolled in their um, employer health insurance. They already, you know, um, their spouse was enrolled in the employer health insurance, and that was the only option. For a lot of folks, it is still unaffordable to have like a spouse and dependents. Um, when the open and when the next open enrollment period for your employer. Um, health plan happens, if you do the math and you realize, hey, it is more than 9.12% of our household income to have our, to um, cover your spouse and children and all of that, um, you can choose not to enroll them in that coverage. And that is also a special enrollment period that would allow you to go onto the marketplace and be eligible for tax credits. Um, so, the way that it's worded, that's one of the things that we wanted to like double check because um, I had a question from someone asking about losing the coverage. A lot of people read that as like, I lost my job or I left my job. And so now that means I've lost that coverage. But even if you do the math and you figure out that it is not affordable and you choose not to enroll in that coverage, that still can qualify you for a special enrollment period and make you newly eligible for tax credits on the marketplace. So I just want to make sure that people understand that. Um, and yeah, that's a, that's a really big change. Um, and that'll really help people moving forward into the year. Because we know a lot of employer, of uh, the open enrollment periods for employer plans are not aligned with the marketplace open enrollment. So just remember that um, it's not a one and done. There are more options as you move forward. Okay, so next slide. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and then the other thing that I also like to make sure that I talk about are the exceptional circumstances, <laughs> the exceptional circumstance uh, enrollments. Um, those are really for um, really uh, catastrophic events, things other than traditional qualifying events. So not marriage or things like that, but being, uh, being affected by a natural disaster. There are hundreds of folks who are eligible through the um, exceptional special enrollment period who are, who are impacted by the flooding in Eastern Kentucky back in August uh, or by the tornadoes in Western Kentucky last uh, December. Um, and that's another example of, uh, that's another way that you can get covered if you do not have it. Um, so anything that is just outside of those life, ex those typical life changes, um, experiencing like, domestic abuse, violence, experiencing spousal abandon, abandonment, or having um, like, technical system issues that prevented enrollment, those are also fairly common and also ways that you can make sure that you get covered if you don't have them. Um, yeah. And you can apply for that next slide. 
the so the special enrollment period you can do on connect.kwater.gov, but for an exceptional special enrollment period, you do have to reach out to the special email connectese at ky.gov or by mail. Um, that is a separate thing. And you just explain what's going on, put your name and information, all of the uh, statements that's in there, explain what's going on. You are impacted by a natural disaster and you need coverage and you just send that email and they can manually enroll you in a plan. So that's available for folks as well. Uh, next slide. And then a reminder, there is the low income SEP available. So for people who are, their income is at or below 150% of the federal poverty line. So 19,000 for a household of one or around 39,000 for a household of four, um, they're eligible for a special enrollment period on the marketplace that allows them to enroll in a plan at any month during the year without having to experience a qualifying life event. So you don't have to get married. You don't have to have a baby. You don't. As long as your income is at or below 150,000, you can enroll in this special enrollment period. This was extended again for this year. Um, so this is still available as well. And you can uh, apply for that also on connect.ky.gov or if you have any problems, you can reach out to KHBE directly and they can manually enroll you using that SCP. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And then the thing that I talked about, the family glitch is fixed. It is in, the, it is effective on Connect right now. So the it should the system should calculate everything properly. Um, and so all you do is put in your information, and it'll tell you if it's affordable or not. If you think that you might be impacted by this, or if you think that the system does not did not calculate it correctly for you please, please, please reach out to me or a connector and we can help uh, We can help fix that for you. Um, we've not heard any reports of it not going okay, but no news is not really good news. And so uh, again, if you think you're impacted, if you think it didn't do something correctly for you, please reach out because we can help make sure that it's, um, it's working for you and you're getting the coverage at the price that you should be paying. Next slide. And then the last update, um, so for um, Medicare, beginning January 1st, a couple of provision, healthcare provisions from the Inflation Reduction Act that passed in August um, went into effect. So free vaccines, really notably the uh, shingles and Tdap uh, vaccines are now included in that. Um, and that'll save, you know, hundreds of dollars because those are pretty expensive. There's the insulin cap. So a month's supply of insulin is now capped at $35 with no deductible. Um, and then the last one, there are now rebates for drug manufacturers increasing prices faster than inflation. So manufacturers will need to pay rebates if their rebates to Medicare if their prices for certain drugs increase uh, for certain drugs exceed inflation. So those are all really cool updates, cool changes. Um, and yeah, shout out to Ira. Um, and that is it. So turning it over to Marcy. And I'm in the chat if you have any questions. Thank you. I'm Marcy Timmerman. I'm sorry for my voice today. Screaming at a, a swim mat, swim meet last night. Apparently I overdid it a bit. So forgive my voice, folks. I'm with Mental Health America of Kentucky. Um, major news from the omnibus bill that passed in December 21st. Um, for mental health, it was one of the largest uh, financial packages for mental health that we've ever seen. So um, I think that's worth a few minutes of time to go through. I promise I will not read every word on these slides. They're very dense. I wanted folks who are kind of our behavioral health nerds to have access to some of the details. Um, these were shared by our national office. I haven't personally read the multi-thousand page document. I'm so glad we have a national organization, by the way. <laughs> So uh, our block grants um, were renewed and actually increased, um, and they set aside a 5% for crisis services. So what that is, is back, for those not familiar, block grants really build the foundation upon which community-based mental health is. So in, in other words, all those community mental health centers that we love, you know, they are funded through the block grant financially primarily. And some of the other programs that you love are also through the block grant. That's just a block of federal dollars. We get to choose what we do with it at the state level. 
Um, but they did require some crisis service support. And I think that's really important. Those of you who know me know uh, 988, you know, you've, if you've been coming a while, you've heard me talk about 988. This gives some money for states to help build up their part of 988, which is great. Um, and then they actually gave money to the suicide prevention lifeline, which is 98 for that transition. They added additional funds. Hopefully that will help some issues that we had. They did have an outage in December. I don't want to pretend that we didn't. We had a couple of days where it was completely down. They have fixed the errors. They are triple checking everything as we speak actually still to make sure that that never ever happens again. Uh, the good news is, is that they're all of your community mental health centers also have a crisis line. So if you ever call 988 and for some reason it's not functioning, please call, default to your local community mental health center. And those are all on our get help page. And I'll drop that in the chat in case anyone needs that. Um, yeah, there was a $70 million increase for our community behavioral health clinics. Um, and then Project AWARE is a youth funding um, project that we have that has been going very strong here in Kentucky, and that also got an increase. Um, children's mental health really has a big theme throughout this entire omnibus, and I think that's really great. We um, know from the Surgeon General last December um, that youth mental health is in crisis. They heard us, right? They are actually listening to this. This is a nonpartisan issue, and I think that's really important. We have been asking for a long time for health and um, family services and the CDC to work together on children's mental health issues. And they were instructed to do so through the omnibus and also given some money for that. Um, next slide, please. In telehealth, those COVID rules that exist from Medicare um, continue. So you don't have to be in person in order to have a telehealth visit with a provider. That's excellent news. We're hoping to change that long-term, but we'll take these short-term little renewals of, of accessibility being granted. Um, Medicare also now finally will pay for marriage and family therapists. So those people with the LMFT after their name and licensed clinical counselors. So our LCCs and our LPCCs can receive um, payment from Medicare now. That's going to be a huge change for our CMHCs, allowing them to see some more patients. That's going to help our workforce a little bit. Um, they are also allowing Medicare coverage for mobile crisis teams. So that 988 response team that might need to go to a site, um, those folks will be available um, and billable, which is another fantastic concept. That's gonna need a little fleshing out. That's not gonna happen overnight, but just know it's coming and I'm really glad to see it. There's some Medicaid stuff going through as well that we'll probably talk about in a couple months. So um, they also wanted to make sure that folks are to being talked about mental health in a lot of different places. And I think that's really great. Um, and then peers, we also saw a lot of changes uh, along peers. And those of you who know peer support specialists are those folks with li lived experience who have been trained how to use that lived experience to help others in a clinical setting. So, um, and not always a clinical setting, but this is where the, these changes are really happening in the clinics. So I don't know any of you um, have been around folks, but like, you know, we used to think of like that AA sponsor, right? That person, I think a lot of people knows what a sponsor is. It's someone you call that peer interaction, you can blow that up and make it even bigger for someone who's having a mental health issue. Just being able to talk to someone else who has had a thought problem, right? Who has not been able to trust their own brain. That is just such a magic experience and bringing that to more level um, is really good. So they allow Medicare to now bill for that uh, in a limited circumstances. They increase the amount of peers that are available in the VA system. So the Veterans Administration is also going to do that. So there's just a lot of little things that you can read in the fine print here. Next slide, please. Um, yes, and we have been talking for a long time about quality measures in healthcare. I think that is something all healthcare has been talking about for a long time. Inpatient psychiatric facilities really didn't have the greatest quality metrics. Um, they increased the uh, kind of metrics and the and frequency of reporting for those. So that's probably a good thing. Um, and then they also added 200 graduate med medical education residency slots for psychiatry. So that should help some of our MDs. I'm hoping to see some of those MD programs here in Kentucky take advantage of those openings. Under Medicaid, um, they have to do a screening and diagnostic services now in 30 days before um, juveniles are uh, released from any kind of juvenile justice situation. So that's a good thing. Uh, gives us some little extra mental health on that. Um, I'm gonna be reading up more on that and publishing a blog. So look for that in future Thrive Communications. Um, they also added, I really thought this was interesting, provider directories have more requirements. They have to have cultural and linguistic capabilities. The ability to communicate with people with disabilities, that includes our IDD folks, our folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities. 
Um, it has telehealth capacity, whether or not a place can, can do telehealth is willing to do it. Um, that's huge, right? And whether they're taking new patients, y'all. So this is going to be a more frequent update of whether folks are taking new patients, and that's going to be required from a lot of insurance companies. This is going to be a huge thing for our network adequacy. Um, Congress requires CMS to issue guidance and new technical assistance center for all the crisis service stuff going on. So again, more crisis things coming up. So go ahead and next slide. This is why I said I wasn't going to read everything that. <laughs> a lot of these are included in some of the other things, but I do want to highlight the maternal mental health hotline at HRSA is for those folks who are new moms or working with new moms who may have a crisis situation. And that number will be prominently displayed in your resources with this. So please make sure that is going on your list of resources and hotlines that people can call. It's mother to mother kind of peer to peer reaction, people who have been trained to understand postpartum and just mental health after having a baby, which doesn't have to be postpartum depression, right? Sometimes it's anxiety or just being a parent <laughs> or just not having sleep for a week, right? So, you know, those are important things. Um, also, I wanted to highlight integrated behavioral health services got a little bit of a boost as well. For those of you who aren't aware of those, those are where we embed and mental health inside a health clinic. So it is not separate from, it is not consulting a, a mental health person. There's actually a therapist and usually a psychiatrist who are on site and can be scheduled within your primary care system. We have quite a few clinics like that here. They got a little boost to do some more, and I hope to see some growth in our rural areas with that for sure. Um, they did include uh, parity protections for state and local employees. Um, I believe Kentucky had that, but I didn't get a chance to verify already that we had done that with our state employees. But now first responders and state employees will be required to have parity with their mental health and physical health programs. What that means is you won't have to fight for a number of visits to see a psychiatrist or therapist. Um, if they limit the number of cardiac rehab, then they can limit mental health rehab. But if they you know, let you to go after a heart attack to cardiac rehab for three to six weeks or whatever, they have to allow you that same mental health care. So I think that's really important. It's going to be really huge, especially for some of those first responders and local employees. Um, they did get rid of the X for buprenorphine, aka Suboxone. So now folks do not have to do the extra training and get an X DEA number in order to do that. That's going to increase the number of providers available to do that. Um, current medical school students typically have that training already embedded. So I think this will be really good for our new docs, especially. Um, I think that's it that I haven't covered. So. Um, State news. Commissioner uh, Morris has decided to leave us for a federal position. She is the longest serving commissioner of any kind of mental health department in the nation. So she's been in place for quite a few um, different groups. And so uh, we are gonna definitely miss her, but really to her credit, you know, the, the leadership team that she has built there is gonna be fine. They're gonna handle this transition really well. We don't know who the interim director is yet and we don't know who will be the permanent replacement, but I think this is a good team that we have running the department. So while we will miss her, it's gonna be in good shape. And if it's not, call me, y'all. Next slide. Uh, another state news. Yeah, this is an update from our 988 system. This was our November numbers. So just con context, it's from November. Uh, more than 50% of our centers have an in-state answer rate of 90% or better. So more than half of Kentucky's CMHCs are answering almost every single call within 20 seconds in their own state, which is fantastic. That is a huge number and a huge growth. 92% um, answer calls in 20 seconds or less. Overall, all the calls that they answer. Um, and then there's some huge referral numbers here. I want to reinforce here the one in red. Less than 1% of all our calls, texts, and chats require to transfer to 911. I think there's still this myth out there that calling 988 is going to get you, you know, fire trucks and police officers anyway. So why would I bother? Why don't I just call 911? It really is not. The the wonderful training that we've had, the new research, the new things, you know, this is a new era of mental health in a lot of ways. We have a lot better services from 988. There are ways we can avoid that for most people. So just want to reinforce that that's really not our default anymore. We really have other options. So, um, And then they hired 11 new staff members in the state for 911. That's huge. We were looking for lots of people. There's still openings. So if y'all need those jobs, let me know. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, this is just a heads up about mental health first aid. Those links will be live to our schedule. I did not get them up on our website yet. So um, let's skip that slide for the most part. <laughs> and it's up to Emily. <laughs> well, thanks, Marcy. And uh, we'll share 
any of that mental health first aid information as soon as you have it. So I wanted to just end by sharing um, some resources and really mainly at this point, some events that are upcoming that you should be adding to your calendars. So Dr. Sheila Schuster, who couldn't be with us today, um, but typically is on these calls with us and has for probably decades been doing an advocacy 101 training. Um, she will be doing an, the annual training, the, the really long, you know, more intensive version of this training on Monday, January 23rd. So just a couple of weeks away. And uh, I'm going to be joining her um, to do that training. And uh, this is a great review, even if you've done it before or some version of it, because we do kind of an abbreviated version um, during our roadshow and during some of these webinars. But this will be two hours of the full training and then an hour with some legislators um, who can provide some firsthand experience um, about you know, how things work in uh, Frankfurt and at, at the Annex and how we can advocate effectively. So this is fantastic. It can even be a good refresher. I always learn something new um, every time I, I participate in this with Sheila. So the registration information will be sent out tomorrow. These links should also be clickable. Um, we're also planning another legislative forum on January 31st. So typically Kentucky Voices for Health, we do one annual legislative forum with our annual meeting. And uh, that was just last month, believe it or not, December 14th. Um, but we have some big changes with committees um, that you know, affect in particular health policy. And so we wanted to really highlight those new committees that Kelly mentioned they've been bifurcated, so separated, you know, health, family services are now separate, both in the House and the Senate. So four committees um, that we want to get to know a little bit more about. And uh, so the committee chairs will be joining us along with some members of the committees. And uh, we'll be talking about policy priorities for the session and uh, lots of other things that are sort of top of mind right now. So please join us for that. That's going to be on the 31st at 3 p.m. and it will be virtual. So unlike the annual meeting that was in person, this will be virtual, easier for people to tune into. Um, our Thrive series um, continues. This is the first of many for 2023. And so um, we have separated this now, um, hopefully to be a little easier to sort of track into our monthly webinars and the forums that we um, hold quarterly with the Cabinet for Health and Family Services, and then our roadshow stops that are in person um, in, you know, communities around Kentucky. And so you'll see um, the dates here. We are, um, and I think the links are live to register for our monthly updates and the quarterly forums with the Cabinet. For the roadshow, we are still working on getting the locations for each of these dates. So this is kind of a save the date, put it on your calendar if you're interested. Um, and by the end of this month, by the end of January, we should have the locations with the dates and registration links available for y'all. So um, one other bit of news I wanna share, if you haven't already heard, the Kentucky Rural Health Association has been kind of leading the charge on starting a new coalition, the Immunized Kentucky Coalition. Kentucky Voices for Health is a core partner, as are some other organizations. And uh, there will be, so that there are public meetings. The next one is February 9th at 10 a.m. And you can get more information from Amber Malat if you want to email her there. Um, we're also asking you to save the date for May 10th, which will be in person an immunization summit at the Embassy Suites uh, Coldstream in Lexington. And that will be a summit where we wanna bring people together for the day, talk about you know, the status of immunizations in Kentucky, some strategies to improve our immunization rates, and Kentucky Voices for Health will also be sharing um, the results of listening sessions that we did all throughout 2022 um, in communities um, asking about you know, what's changed in terms of how people understand immunizations, who is or isn't getting immunizations, and, and what we can do about it. Um, some more resources that I won't go through um, one by one, but just know they're here in the slide deck for you. These are things that we have typically um, put in the slide deck and update um, every month. And 
If you are a licensed social worker or a certified community health worker and you want CE credit, um, again, just email Kelly and she can get that taken care of. We also, in addition to sending out the slides and the um, recording and the other you know, various resources and links that we share during these webinars, we'll send you an evaluation and we'd love your feedback. We always want to know, you know what information was most helpful, what wasn't as helpful, and what you want more of. So please take a look um, for that evaluation link in tomorrow's email. And with that, um, I think we can wrap it up now, um, almost on time. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. And we'll see you next month, if not sooner, January 23rd or January 31st. All right. Bye. Have a good one.